PhD in multiple sclerosis research. So I looked there at the role of the innate immune system in MS, um, and it was very much focused on immunology of MS. Uh, I then continued doing uh, immunology research, but I moved on to melanoma, uh, where I did a postdoc at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. Um, and then I left the lab uh, to, do, to spend a number of years in medical communications and clinical trials before I moved back to Ireland um, just over a year ago to become the MS program manager at Genomics Medicine Ireland. So just a brief overview of my talk today, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of what genomics is, um, and then just talk about what we know about MS uh, genetics so far. Um, then just talk about our company, Genomics Medicine Ireland, and our MS study, and then how you, how you can take part if you would like to. Uh, and then I'll just finish off with a nice case study about that highlights the power that genomics research can have. So firstly, what is genomics? So we'll just, I'll just play a quick video now, um, it's a couple of minutes long, and it should just give you a brief introduction to what genomics is. Genomics is a study of genomes. The word genome refers to all the DNA contained in the cells of our body. It's like a very special instruction manual that is unique to you and contains all the information needed to make you, run you and repair you. DNA is a code made up of a four-letter alphabet, A, C, G and T, called bases. The order of this code changes slightly from person to person to make you who you are. If you wrote down all the letters of DNA code contained in one cell, it would be three billion letters long. So if you put together all the DNA in your entire body, you could reach from Earth to the Moon nearly 6,000 times. It coils and coils and continues to coil until it fits into a tightly packed structure called a chromosome. Each of us has 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 in total, in each cell. You get one half of these chromosomes from your mother and the other half from your father. Your body is a very complicated system, which means your instruction manual needs to contain a lot of information. Scientists embarked on the first full reading of this instruction manual in 1990 with the Human Genome Project, which took 13 years and cost $2.7 billion. Since then, we've had huge leaps in technology, which now make these readings much faster and less costly. Scientists want to better understand the unique differences in our genomes. These differences are called variants, and these variations make us individual. For example, giving us different eye colour or hair colour. Most of these variations have no effect on our health. However, some have been shown to cause or contribute to certain health conditions. Scientists have also discovered that these variations in our genome can influence if we develop a disease, how that disease progresses and how we respond to medications. Our genome is not the only thing to influence our health. Lifestyle and environmental factors, such as diet, activity levels and stress, also play a part. The scientists at Genomics Medicine Ireland are studying the genomes and lifestyles of tens of thousands of people in Ireland to better understand how changes in our genome and lifestyle affect our health. We hope to use this information to help prevent and treat disease and ultimately improve our country's future health. Okay, so that video just gives you a brief overview of what genomics is. Obviously, it was quite quick, so I'll just give a few slides to kind of recap what it said and um, to make sure we're all on the same uh, page. So what, it, what are genes, first of all? So genes are instructions for our body. So these are inherited from our parents, from both our mother and our father. They influence characteristics such as hair colour and height, but also in some cases genes can contribute to whether we get a disease or not, like MS. So in MS, it's not a, that MS is passed from your parents to your 
uh, siblings, um, unless, sorry, parents to offspring, uh, it's not just one gene that causes it. So there's a number of different genes that can contribute to your risk of getting MS. So in other diseases, it's one specific gene, such as cystic fibrosis. So that's one gene that causes um, whether a person gets cystic fibrosis or not. But then in MS, it's a number of different genes that interact together. So what is genomics then? So this is the study of our genomes. And our genomes refer to all of the DNA that is contained within our body. So our genome really is our instruction manual. So it, it, it contains all the information that is required to run us, to make us, run us, and repair us. So genomics is the study of all the DNA contained within the cells of our body. So what is DNA? So this is a code made up of four letters called bases. So the four bases are A, C, G, and T. So these bases pair together. So C always pairs with G, and T always pairs with A. But the order in which these bases um, are in each of us individually differs slightly from person to person. And that's what makes us all unique. So if we were all had the exact same order, uh, we would all be the exact same. Um, but each cell can have as many as 3 billion base pairs. So obviously that's a lot, a lot of DNA. So how do we fit this DNA into our bodies? So within each cell, the DNA is packed into tightly coiled structures called chromosomes. And then each chromosome is made up of DNA tightly coiled many times around these proteins. So this is where you see in a lot of places where you see a picture of DNA, like in our GMI symbol, it's this helix structure. So that's showing that it's all coiled around so that they, it can all fit into our bodies. How many chromosomes do we have? So everyone has 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, 46 in total. So 23 are inherited from our father and 23 are inherited from our mother. So what are the differences in our genomes? So for many years now, scientists have been looking at the differences in our genomes. But more recently, obviously, with the advance in advancements in technology, uh, we're looking even further than what we were looking before. Uh, so all of the differences between us are called variants. Uh, some of these are inherited from our parents, but some arise from new mutations. So mutation just means that it's a change. So a change in the order of your bases uh, in comparison to, say, your parents. The variation makes us individual, so in theory it's a good thing, so it can give us different hair colour and eye colour, uh, but also it can, it can impact our health, our susceptibility to health, or to some diseases, and it can impact our health as well. So then what, are, what do we know already about the role of genetics in MS? So, as I said, genes do play a role in, in MS, but they're not the only thing. So, so far, um, 110 genes have been linked to MS. So, um, you need a combination of these genes together. If you have all these genes, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you will get MS. Um, it, it just increases your risk of getting MS. So, no single gene causes someone to develop MS, but certain genes can make one person more susceptible and so far, we've identified 110 of those genes. Um, so, as I said, most people with these genes don't necessarily develop MS. Um, so, environmental factors and lifestyle factors um, also play a role. So, environmental factors, I'm sure you've all heard about vitamin, vitamin D. Um, also, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so, exposure to Epstein-Barr virus is another um, factor that plays a role. And also, lifestyle factors, such as uh, smoking as well. So this is a, a virus that 99% um, of us are all uh, infected with. So it's, it's very, you know, the difference between people who uh, have MS and don't have MS, the, the amount of people who have been infected with it are actually very small. So most of us have come to expose with it at some points in our lives, but we haven't shown any symptoms. But in MS, the, the number, the percentage is that much higher, that it's statistically have higher, that pretty much everyone who has MS has been exposed to this virus. But it, it doesn't, in, in most cases, it doesn't show any symptoms. So it's just a virus we pick up as we go along, like a flu virus. Yeah. So to, to recap, what causes MS? So we have a genetic predisposition, so some of those 110 genes. Then there's also environmental factors and a, or a lifestyle trigger. So in general, it could be an infection that causes uh, MS to start. 
This causes autoimmunity, so this is when our body starts attacking itself. And this leads to the loss of my myelin and nerve fibre. So then the signals don't go directly uh, to the brain and then that causes our problems such as um, not being able to walk and things like that. Um, so as I said, it's not passed directly from parents to their children, but you could inherit the risk genes. So you're not necessarily going to get it if your parent has it. Uh, so what is the actual genetic factor? So the risk of getting MS in, so this is based on UK data. Uh, if you grow up in the UK, it's one in 330. But if one of your parents has it, it increases. So it's one in 67 if one parent has it. If a sibling has it, it's one in 37. And if you have an identical twin who has it, then it's one in five. So this shows that there's, it, there's definitely a genetic component, but there's also other factors such as environmental and lifestyle factors. So what can we learn from genetic research then? So we can understand why certain people are more likely to develop MS, and then once we know that, we can design strategies that reduce the risk of developing MS. We can also learn more about how MS develops by investigating what each of these different genes do, and then by knowing what these genes do, we can then target them and try and treat them to stop them from doing what they're doing that causes MS. So unfortunately, I couldn't find the stats. There isn't, we can find the prevalence, but you can't find the different um, breakdown for the family members. Sorry. Yeah, but it is, I know. <laughs> yeah. So there is data on prevalence and that depends. So I'm sure many of you know that the prevalence is higher in the northwest of Ireland than it is in the southeast. So the prevalence across the country would be quite similar. So I think it's one in 400 in Ireland, but it is hard to find for the, the fam familial studies. It seems that um, from your, your diagram there, you've got a genetic component, the previous one, and you've got an environmental component, something that's kind of more epigenetic rather than purely genetic. If you're just studying the genetics, how do you get to the, the environmental triggers that cause that, that, that actually cause the trigger? I kind of think of this as sort of the, 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 the genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. How do, how do you, do, are so, you studying the triggers as well as the, as the genetics? Yes, so we're looking at environmental factors, lifestyle factors and genotypic factors. So we're looking at all three combined together. We'll also be looking at epigenetic changes. Uh, as, our, as we go on, we'll be looking at protein changes and m metabolite changes. So basically we're trying to encompass everything at once because it, you're completely right. It's not just, if we just study our genes, we're not going to get any further because we need to see what this relationship is between the genes and the environment. Okay. okay, so then coming on to genomics research in Ireland. Uh, so I work for GMI, which is Genomics Medicine Ireland. Um, our goal as a company is to solve diseases of genetic origin worldwide. So obviously it's a big goal. Uh, we started three years ago, so we're at the start of the process, but we're hopeful that we can at least solve some of them, hopefully MS. Um, so the, our different aims are to study the genomes and lifestyles. So as um, the, the man at the back highlighted, we're also looking at the lifestyles and the environmental factors of thousands of people in Ireland. So for these genetic studies, you need very large numbers. So we are looking, for instance, up to, to recruit up to two thirds of the population of people with MS in Ireland. You need such large numbers because the changes can be very small. So if you only have a small change um, in one person, you can't determine if that's caused the disease or not. But if you have you know, six or 7,000 people, then you can see that maybe it's, it's in quite a proportion of those people. So you do need very large numbers for these kind of population genomic studies. Yeah, I'll, sh I'll come on to what we actually do then. Um, it's, it's very straightforward, with blood tests is, is it? Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so then we aim to better our understanding of how changes in the genome and lifestyle can affect our health. Uh, we hope to use this information to help prevent and treat disease, and then ultimately to improve our future's country health. 
Why then are we looking at genetic diseases? So as we've discussed, um, MS is a, a genetic disease. It is a complex disease, a genetic disease. So there's more than one genetic factor that's uh, involved. But you are seven times more likely to have MS if a first degree family member has it. Similarly with uh, Crohn's disease, so a lot of autoimmune diseases um, have this genetic component that, that is based on, that also has environmental factors. Uh, so in Crohn's, you're eight, fold, you're eight times more likely to uh, develop Crohn's if a first degree relative has it. Yeah, sorry. And um, just a question, if your family members have a different neurological disease, would that affect your MS? Would that affect the... The likelihood of getting... So, um, in terms of the gene network, it's actually more likely an autoimmune disease. So the autoimmune diseases I, I presented yesterday, and it was a, it's a nice picture to show that many of the genes for autoimmune diseases are common. Um, so, you know, for like type, like uh, Crohn's disease, um, what else, MS, um, lupus, and many other like autoimmune diseases, they all have very uh, common diseases that are shared among them. Um, so the neurological one, so much, if it was an autoimmune one, perhaps, yes, but not so much as the, like, because most of the genes that are related to MS are related to the immune side rather than the neurological side of it. Uh, so then just to give you a bit of background about the company um, in general, so we were founded in 2015, so we're, we're uh, quite a young company. Um, so I started about a year ago and there was 40 employees and now we have about 100, so we're growing quite rapidly. It's, it's very exciting, all the research is, is um, very uh, high tech and it's, it's a great place to be at the moment. Uh, we are a private company, but we're part publicly funded, so we're part funded by the Irish Strategic Investment Fund as well. Um, we're an Irish life science company leading large-scale research studies across Ireland. So we're looking, I'll come on to it in the next couple of slides, but we're looking across a number of different conditions and we're also uh, recruiting uh, healthy controls as well. So this is so that we can compare people with a condition to people without, but people who are very similar. So if we are genetically similar, uh, if we look at Irish people versus Irish people, so Irish people with a condition versus Irish people without a condition, that means that we can more easily detect any genetic causes that are, caused, that are actually causing the condition. So if we're genetically diverse, if we're looking at people from different countries, it's much more difficult to pick up these different changes that cause disease. Um, we partner with pharmaceutical partners, so we're very much at the start of the di discovery process, so we are looking to identify what causes the disease or what causes the disease to progress and, and the uh, interaction between environmental and lifestyle factors, but we don't go on to make the drugs themselves. So once we um, find a drug target, then we partner with pharmaceutical partners to make sure that these drugs are actually made. Um, we develop partnerships to help develop uh, new treatments and improve diagnostics. So we partner with um, clinicians, with volunteers, so people like yourselves um, and the pharmaceutical partners to make sure that each from, we're really there from the very start until the very end to making sure that we're getting the right target and then that eventually that the drug will be made as well. So we're utilising next generation sequencing. So uh, Travis introduced me yesterday saying that it was the future uh, and it is very much. Uh, so we have a lab at Cherrywood and it's all a very high tech. Um, so when I did my PhD many years ago, I, we, I wasn't fortunate enough to have such high tech uh, equipment. But um, now we're using the very most modern equipment so that we can look at every single letter of our genome. So we're looking at every single one of those three billion base pairs and comparing them to people without MS. Wow. <laughs> it's a lot, of re a lot of analysis. We need a lot of computers and people with um, computer minds. So this is kind of showing um, how we can help at, at every stage of the process. So we start here where we look at the patient or the person with MS in this case um, here. Uh, so we look and see, can we see what is going on um, before we make the drug? So that means that we're looking at the right biology. Then from that, we can develop a right target. Then the right molecule can be developed and at the right dose as well. So genetics can also show if uh, a person maybe doesn't respond very well to a drug, so maybe they should be getting a higher dose than others. So genomics can really help at each, each stage of the, prof, uh, of the process. So you can see this here from the very start up to the, to, to the actual trials where it goes into uh, people with MS. 
Um, as I said, we're expanding across the country. So in the last, I think last year, there was only a few dots on this page, but now um, we're really after expanding. So we're, these are the participating hospitals at the moment, and we're kind of talking to uh, most of the hospitals uh, across the country. Uh, so you can see a very extensive list here. And then these are the initial research areas. So MS was the first condition that we started, um, and we've recruited now a thousand people with MS onto our study. Um, we're also running IBD and we've just over a thousand people on that study as well and then the rest are a little bit um, further behind so our spondyloarthropodes which is a type of arthritis um, we've recruited I think only started recruiting there uh, brain tumors is a separate study where we have a, a biobank of brain tumors we're looking at rare disorders um, our fitness study is where we're getting the healthy controls so that to ensure that we have the right controls for this study and then all of these down here are starting in the coming months. So we're kind of looking across a number of different uh, conditions to try and elucidate what um, the genetic and environmental causes are. Oh, sorry. Um, so as I said, we built a lab um, in Cherrywood and in Dublin. Um, so this is actually my husband here, Tim. So he also works for GMI. Uh, and this is Amy in the lab. So this is the NovaSeq. Um, this is one of those very high tech machines that uh, I was talking about. So this is where this machine is what reads each single base pair, each letter of our DNA. So the three billion letters is read by this little machine here. Um, so the lab is among the largest in Europe. It's over 10,000 square foot. It can do high volume sequencing. So sequencing literally means reading the letters of the, the DNA. Um, so it's an, uh, the accreditation of the lab is in pro progress. So you need to make sure that everything is certified. Um, and we opened back in February uh, of this year. So then coming on to the um, MS study in, sp uh, in particular, which I'm sure you're all interested to hear about. Um, so just a bit of background to show that it is great to see that people with MS are really interested in genetics research. So um, in the MS Ireland Research Priority Survey, I'm sure some of you uh, took part in the survey, uh, people were asked what research questions regarding MS would you like to see addressed and why? And we can see here at number eight that genetics is here. So it's great to see, as I said, that people are really interested and want to see more um, information coming out about genetics. So the aim of our study, so um, as I said, the genetic factors, environmental factors and lifestyle factors all play a role in the development and the progression of MS. So we're trying to understand more about all of these factors. So we're studying those three different factors uh, in people with MS and comparing those to people without MS. So uh, we want to better our understanding of MS and we hope to use this information to improve future health by identifying novel drug targets, which may be used to develop more effective and tailored therapeutics uh, to help with early diagnosis of the disease and to better understand how the disease is likely to progress. So then this, just, this video just gives a quick overview of how, if you would like to take part, how uh, you can do so. so If you or someone you know is considering volunteering for a Genomics Medicine Ireland research study, we hope this video will give you an overview of what's typically involved. It's important to note that this is a general overview and that some studies may vary. Genomics Medicine Ireland is a privately held Irish life sciences company working in partnership with clinicians, volunteers from the general public, academic researchers and the pharmaceutical industry. We're leading research studies across Ireland, looking at changes in DNA and how they influence the development, progression and treatment of a number of different medical conditions. We are also looking at changes in our DNA that contribute to our well-being. We believe this research will lead to the development of new treatments and diagnostics and advance the future health of people both here in Ireland and around the world. Before you decide whether or not to volunteer for a GMI research study, a member of the research team will explain the study to you, answer any questions you may have, and check that you understand what's involved in participation. You will also be given a participant information leaflet, which provides full written detail about the study. All GMI research studies are voluntary. We want our volunteers to feel comfortable being a part of this research. 
you do volunteer and change your mind later, you can withdraw without giving a reason. Not taking part will not affect your health care in any way. To volunteer, you must be 18 or older and be able to make a decision yourself on whether or not to take part. If you do decide to volunteer, the research team member will ask you to sign a consent form. This is a record that lets us know that you're happy to be involved and to allow GMI to use your information in our research studies. A research team member will then collect the study samples and information from you. For most of our studies, participation only involves one appointment, at which time you will provide a blood sample. This will be taken by a trained staff member experienced in drawing blood, who will make every effort to minimise any discomfort to you. If you are participating in one of GMI's studies investigating your medical condition, study participation normally takes place at one of your routine clinical visits so that no extra appointment is needed. We will also ask you to provide some information about your health and fill out a short lifestyle questionnaire about you, your health and family history. If you need assistance, the research team member will be happy to help. By taking part in our research studies, you can help advance scientific research to improve health in a number of ways. This could include helping doctors diagnose medical conditions as early as possible and also give doctors a better understanding of how a condition is likely to progress. We will also gain a better understanding of which medicines are best suited to treat individual patients. And in the long term, this research can lead to the development of new medicines to help treat a range of medical conditions. But this is just the beginning of the story as we try and understand what differences in everyone's genomes mean. Because of this, you won't receive any feedback relating to your individual genetic profile. But over time, you may benefit from our research findings as new diagnostic tests and treatments become available. If you have any further questions about volunteering for this research, please speak with the research team member at your study site. We thank you for considering volunteering. Okay, so like the last time, I'll just go through it a bit more slowly so um, we can kind of discuss it. If anyone has any questions, then make sure you can ask. Okay, so uh, how do you participate? So first of all, all of the studies are approved by research ethics committee. So we, each of the hospitals has a different ethics committee. So we submit it to make sure that it is an ethically sound study. So they're all approved. Uh, then you present at your clinical site or your GP clinic. Um, the research team will give you the information about the study. So this is a patient information leaflet and a consent form. So you read through the information that's, that's given. Um, if you have any questions, you ask the research team and you make sure that you're comfortable in, you, that you know all the information that's required. And then you sign the informed consent form afterwards. So then once you've signed that, then the researcher will collect a blood sample for, from you. So this will be uh, three different blood samples, but just using one needle. Um, so it's about 30 mils of blood. Um, and then you fill out the lifestyle questionnaire. So that has loads of different questions, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then the research team look um, at your, you can send them to look at your uh, clinical notes. So then they look at your clinical notes to, to determine things like relapse information, response to treatment uh, and various things like that. So again, that's to see if we can correlate the genetic information with things like why, why some people get more relapses or why some people progress quicker or, and things like that. So then in terms of the person who is volunteering um, in, terms of, in terms of their involvement, it is very straightforward. So it's about half an hour in total. So it, it is the blood samples and then you fill out the questionnaire. Then the research team, after you've let, left the clinic, they then enter your um, clinical data. So all of your data from your, your chart that the hospital or your GP has. They enter that then into our electronic um, data capture system. Uh, the research team send the blood to um, GMI and then uh, people like my husband Tim, he extracts the, the DNA from the blood sample and then they do the whole genome sequencing which was done on that machine that I showed you. So that's where they read every letter of your DNA. 
So then um, our research team, so we've got a team of researchers, scientific researchers and bioinformatic people, so they're the computer whizzes. They um, combine all this data, so the lifestyle data, the environmental data and the clinical data. They can combine this into a massive database and they look for trends to see if there's something different uh, between the people with MS compared to the people without MS. Uh, so we work with research collaborators, so the, um, some of our, our clinicians are, are geneticists as well, so we work with them to, to elucidate what's, what's going on, um, and then with pharma partners to um, hopefully accelerate drug, dis uh, drug development. So if we um, discover a drug target, then this company goes on and, and develops the drug. Um, so really the potential input, uh, impact for, um, for people with MS is that it speeds up the process. So it speeds up the process of drug development. Also, hopefully we will end up with better diagnostics and more ideas about why uh, people progress at different rates and then hopefully develop treatments for, for them. So why, um, why would you take part in this study? So obviously a study like this or any research study would not be possible without volunteers like yourselves. Um, and really, as I mentioned at the start, uh, in terms of these population genomic studies, we need very large numbers so that we can have any statistical um, significant data. Um, so we need uh, to develop a genomic database of people with a condition and versus the people without a condition. Um, as I said, we are aiming to identify specific genetic factors that contribute to the development, progression and treatment of MS. And hopefully this will uh, lead to individualised treatments and then ultimately a, a cure. And then something that is very important is I think um, some of the people who volunteered or were about to volunteer initially were a bit concerned that if they take part in, in our study, they mightn't be able to do a clinical trial, but that's completely not the case. So if you do GMI study, you're, you're more than free to do any other research study, whether it's a clinical trial or research study um, on anything. So it doesn't um, exclude you from doing anything, any other research. So will the uh, research benefit you directly? So genomic studies by their nature take time, research in general, I'm sure as you're aware it's frustrating but they, it does take time. Um, so the goal for this research is not to treat specific participants but it is to expand our knowledge and in the long term come up with developing new treatments. Um, so you won't get any uh, results back yourself but hopefully in the future it will lead to better care and better treatment for people with MS. Um, so as I said, it will increase our understanding of the relationship between the genome and disease. So what happens to your DNA? So your DNA, so the research team will obviously have your uh, information, your, you will be discussing it with them, but people in GMI would never see your personal information. So we won't be able to identify you from, from the information that we have. So you're giving a different code, the code is then transferred transferred into another code so uh, GMI are you know two steps away from knowing who the person is that their data they're looking at and um, so your medical lifestyle and biological information will be studied together with that of the other participants so from their healthy control study and from our MS study and um, to identify factors that contribute to disease so how is your privacy pr protected? Um, obviously, the, I'm sure you've all heard about the new GDPR regulations, uh, which <laughs> a lot of know. <laughs> um, so they came out in May this year. Um, luckily, our company was set up, we knew that these were coming, so we were set up with already the framework in place, so we didn't actually have to change anything. Um, so we're registered with the Data Protection Commissioner. As I said, they're all approved by ethics committees, we're audited, and then all of our data is depersonalized, so the identifiers such as the participant's name or date of birth are never held in GMI database. So then coming back to the actual type of data that we look at, so this is the lifestyle data, so if you're filling out our lifestyle questionnaire, it's about eight pages long, it should take about 15 minutes, some people it takes a little bit longer, some people a little bit shorter, as is, as is normal. Um, and so these are the different things we look at, we look at things like sleep, health supplements, alcohol, allergies, exercise, diet, caffeine consumption, smoking, ancestry and education level. So that's not just it, there's a few more things as well. Um, so we're trying to capture as much information as we can, but obviously not to overburden people who are doing the questionnaire so it's not too long. So I think we've covered the, definitely the main, main points that are, that are required. 
And then this is um, the clinical data. So this is what, what is looked at by the clinical team when they go through their your notes. So you wouldn't have to actually have to provide any of this information. This is all done by the research team. Um, so it, this is always uh, disease specific. So this is the kind of stuff we look for for MS. So family history, year of diagnosis, smoking history, disease activity, previous medical history, uh, the disease modifying uh, therapies that the Prof uh, Giovanni was uh, talking about earlier, then other medication um, and adverse re reactions to medications and relapse information. So for things like medication, we want to see particularly the disease modifying therapies. If you didn't respond well to a therapy, we want to see if there's a genetic reason for that. Uh, things like relapses, we want to see if there's a genetic reason why people get more relapses or how severe they are. Um, and then we look at a number of different um, things at the present as well, so your age, your gender, some lab tests, the other medications you're taking, and then we do this, uh, you also fill out one page of a, a patient de determined disease steps questionnaire, I'm, I'm sure some of you might have heard of it before, so it's, it's a one question to determine how severe your MS, MS is on that particular day. And then in the future, so this is to see how, um, if your disease is progressing, so we can make sure that we can track progression. Um, but again, you don't have to do anything. It would be the researcher who looks at your notes on a yearly basis for five years. So to make sure that we're capturing if a person has progressed or not. So again, trying to make the most of the information we have so then in terms of sites that we're actually open at at the moment, so we've, we're open at four sites at the moment. So this is uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, then the Western Trust, which is up in Northern Ireland. Um, so that's run with Citric, our partners up there. Uh, we're running with T Intala Hospital and Cork University Hospital. So we have, uh, we're working with all the neurologists in these um, hospitals um, and th they're, the, they're the four centres that have recruited so far up over a thousand uh, people with MS. Um, but we are expanding very rapidly across the country. We're trying to get into as many hospitals as uh, we can. So we have ethics approved or submitted. So for all of these hospitals here, uh, so Limerick, Letterkenny, Sligo, Mercy, Craigavon and Dundonald are up in the north as well. They're near Belfast. And then the Hermitage is, is our first private clinic. So that's in Dublin. Um, so all of these will be opening in the very near future. And then also the Bonds in Cork. Um, we're just preparing that application now. Um, so if you're a, a patient of any of these um, participant in centres, you can, you can enrol at these, at these hospitals. Um, but we're also trying to make it as easy as possible for people with MS um, to enrol in the study um, and in, in general for all our conditions. So we've now just started doing primary care collections where we work with the GPs. Um, so these are the, our, our primary care centres. Um, you can see there's, there's a, a, the list here. But again, these are very much expanding. So our first primary care centre is opening in Mallow. Um, I think this is Mallow next week. So this will be our first primary care centre, but the rest of them will be opening soon. And again, we're, we're kind of expanding across the country to make it as easy as possible. We're also looking at kind of different models as well. So perhaps doing some home visits, particularly for people who are more progressed um, and maybe some community recruitment as well. And if any of you have any suggestions on how we can make things easier, we, we would always take feedback and we really want to make it as easy as possible and convenient for people who are taking part. So here's the information of how to take part. So um, you can register your, your interest at, um, our we on our website. So this is the link here. Um, so then you know, if one of your um, sites are open, then we will let you know that. If not, we will keep you uh, on our database and we will contact you as soon as your site opens and let you know. Or if we start, um, for instance, community recruitment, we'll let you know. So this is a great way to make sure that you're informed of anything, any updates about the study. Um, really, you should always ask your consultant or GP at your next appointment. Um, so they may already be a part of the study, but they mightn't have asked you yet, just due to capacity of their research staff. So it's always good to ask. Um, and as I said, we're opening new sites and GP practices soon, so you can just keep an eye on our website to see. Um, but I would, uh, if you are really interested, I would encourage you to register on our website. So then what is the value for people with MS? So really, as I mentioned earlier, it's really the speed and potential for therapeutics in the future. Uh, so Andrea O'Mahony was one of our first um, people with MS who enrolled in, down in Cork. Um, so she said she's really excited by the potential of this research study by GMI to identify the, the genetic markers of MS, which could lead to early detection, more accurate targeted treatments and more. 
The more people who partake in the study, the better we can understand the, the disease, and this brings with it the potential to, in time, find a cause and a cure. So she, obviously she was very happy to par, uh, partake. She was on the 6-1 News as well, which was, uh, which was great. And then Dr. Brian Sweeney, I'm sure he might be some of your uh, doctors down in Cork. He's an amazing um, consultant. Um, so he was al also very keen about the study, and you can see, read his quote here as well. Uh, so this was, um, that's Dr. Brian Sweeney here, and this is, that's Andrea there. This is the research team down in Cork. So that was on the, the RT61 News. And then we were on the MS website and the Irish Times, and then on some genome websites as well. Um, so as well as our Irish collection, um, so as I said, we're really focused on all of our prospective studies, so all the, the, the studies that we're looking um, actively recruiting for, we're really focused on Ireland. Um, but also to ensure that we have enough power of the study, we're also looking at international collaboration. Um, so you might have, some of you might have seen this in, in the Irish Times or the Sunday Business Post. So we recently um, have started collaborating with Professor Stephen Saucer over in the University of Cambridge. He is an expert in genetics in MS. He's one of the leaders in the whole world for MS genetics. So we're really, really delighted to um, work with him. He has a biobank, so he's already collected DNA samples from over 15,000 people with MS in the UK. Um, so we are going to work with him to, to work on those samples. Um, and obviously, as I said previously, the bigger the numbers we have, the more discovery potential there is, the, the greater power we have to discover something. So this was a really great for us and for people with MS. So um, it, was, it was a great thing. Um, and again, just even having his additional expertise, as I said, he's one of the leaders in M MS genetics in the world, so, and he's a lovely man, so um, it's great to work with him. So then just to uh, summarise, so we're really hoping that Ireland becomes a genomic centre of excellence. Um, this is to accelerate medical research, discover novel genes and drug targets, and then ultimately to speed up the development of treatments for people with a number of different conditions. So that's kind of the whole MS study and GMI um, in a nutshell. Um, and then I was just going to finish with a, a nice case study about the power of genomic research. So this, um, is, this is a case study based on our study that's running at Temple Street Hospital. So this is in rare disorders. So in these cases, um, a lot of the, the people with the rare disorder, they're only, ch they're only young children, but they haven't received a diagnosis. So they have some, some symptoms, but it's never, they've never got a proper diagnosis and often not a proper treatment. So in this case, we're giving back the results to the team and our research team are working on their results to try and get a diagnosis um, for, for the patient, for the, for the child in most cases. Um, so this is slightly different to MS because then in, as I said, in MS, it's a number of different genetic causes, whereas in, in a lot of these rare conditions, it is one gene change that will actually cause the disease. So um, it's very, very powerful in these rare disorders. So um, there was an eight-year-old girl called Mary Ann. Uh, she was living with dystonia, which is a neurological condition. Uh, she was, so she was living with that for several years. But then it actually degenerated into a life-threatening variation in April 2017. She deteriorated until she was completely mute and she was placed on a ventilator with poor prognosis. Uh, she was then referred, so she was over in the UK, but she was referred over to Professor Mary King, um, who is a consultant neurologist at Temple Street. Um, so she, she, she suggested that um, Mary Ann's DNA should be whole genome sequenced with, um, in collaboration with our study at GMI. So first of all, uh, before that happened, they did a number of different investigations, so I won't go through them because obviously there's, there's a number of different types of investigations, but just to show that they looked at basically everything possible. So they looked at blood imaging and their cerebral sp uh, spinal fluid, and then they did look at genetics, but they looked at specific genetic genes that they know are related to dystonia. So this is where the power of looking at every single base pair of your genome can come into place. So if you look at that, then you won't, you're not just looking at specific ones like these ones here. So um, we whole genome sequenced her DNA, and then we found that there was just one change that actually was causing her to have this condition. So it was a change in a gene called KMT2B. Uh, it was a deletion of, in, in that gene, so one base was just deleted, and that caused such horrendous effects. 
Um, so then um, uh, Dr. Eva Foreman, who was doing her PhD with us at the time, um, she looked through the literature, and this is where literature searches are amazing, so she found lots of publications that showed the patients with this similar symptoms to Mary Ann also had changes in this gene. So it, it might have been a different change, but it was in the same gene. Um, and these, these people with um, different, uh, like different conditions, they were treated with deep brain stimulation. Um, and they, it, it actually worked for these patients. Uh, obviously, deep brain stimulation is not something you would normally give to a child, but because um, Mary Ann was on life support at the time, there was no other choice. Um, her life support was just about to be removed. Um, so they said, well, we, obviously we have to try it. So she was airlifted over um, to the UK, I think it was, to, for, for the deep brain stimulation procedure. And then within 24 hours of treatment, she was up playing with her toys. And then she spoke her first word in over four years, and that was mama. So and that was the outcome there. Yeah. So that was obviously a great case. Um, and just to show that the power of genomic research, I do want to caveat it's obviously not the same in MS because it is ca different causes. Um, so I don't want to give you like too much hope or whatever, but it is just nice to see that genomics does have very powerful um, um, thing, outcomes. Um, so here are my contact details. I have uh, cards as well. So if anyone wants to contact me or ask me any questions now, I'm very happy to answer. siblings of MS, MS people? So at the moment we're not actively recruiting, no, we're not going to contact families of them because it has some ethical considerations because obviously maybe the sibling might not want to take part. So if they enrol in the study, we, we have that documented if their sibling has MS. So we, we, we capture how many of their family has MS. So that kind of lets us know how genetically uh, how many maybe genetic um, variations that that person has that makes them more susceptible, but we're not actively going out to recruit mainly because of the ethical considerations because, you know, people might want their, they don't want their information passed on, for instance, so. I actually, um, I've, I've enrolled on this study anyway okay. in uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, but um, I think that lady was also asking, because her brother has MS, she doesn't have MS, can she still enrol on the, on the study or not? Oh, if she doesn't have MS? Yeah. Uh, so not as, so it wouldn't be as part of the MS study, but you can certainly enrol in our healthy volunteer study. So we have that up and running in UCD at the moment and we're expanding it. So it will be, uh, we're setting up a center in town by Trinity. And um, so you can certainly enrol in that and you can have down that your sibling has MS and then genetically we will be able to, to detect that as well. So yeah, sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so th they're obviously both neurological conditions, but in terms of the genetics, I am not too sure. I think, as I said, like most of the, because epilepsy is not so immune mediated, so I would think not. Um, but because they're both neurological, there are, there can be some links, but really the more, um, genetically linked ones are more um, autoimmune ones rather than other neurological ones. I'm sorry, no, but, um, where I live, there's a um, um, that have MS and were diagnosed at the same time. And I'm just wondering, like, is there like a very obvious environmental factor um, that would cause MS? Because as I say, we live in a small location. And you're not related? We're not related. Really? Okay. Yeah. So there our studies all the time and they, they think you know there's things like vitamin D that clear, has a clear association but we don't know in, in cases like that it's extremely interesting to see if you were exposed to something that caused it or not. I would say there probably was some exposure of some sort but I don't know exactly what it would be for instance. Hi I just yeah. sorry um, I just wanted to ask you is there um I would, over the years, I would have read, is there a um, link between MS and uh, type 1 diabetes? 
be type one, so type one, yeah, uh, insulin I, I, dependent. Yes, no, because so I was just wondering. My sister has it, and my dad has it, mm -hmm. and just I was wondering, was there any link? Or? Yeah, I'm not too sure no. to be honest. Yes, sorry, oh, I don't that's know. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. I had been doing a lot of work on a family tree and mm. it became very obvious that there were quite a number of people with MS on one particular branch of that tree. Yeah. Has there been any studies on, you know, a family kind of literally a family tree branch and the incidence of MS kind of, is that not an area that would Yes, so highlight has, the genetics. You yes, know, so the there has. So how we know about the genetic components so far is is mainly through familial studies and families like yourselves would be very interesting to study. So in some cases, for instance, some some people might only have a few genetic variants that are causing it, and then it was more an environmental trigger. So it, it is different in different cases, but in in familial cases, it means that you have more of the genetic factors. So you would certainly be more like be very interesting to study in a study like this because we know that gen genetics is really really playing a role. And do, do you know what environmental factors can cause it? Well, there are things. So the literature out there, it is things like EBV, vitamin D, uh, body mass index. Um, so there are many environmental factors like smoking as well that, that cause it. So you know we are looking at all of them in com combination with genetics. Yeah. Hi, I have sensory MS and then I was told by my neurologist that fibromyalgia is part of it. Okay. I also have trigeminal neuralgia, so uh, where is the link with those? Yes, yeah, so I guess comorbidities, as you know, are really uh, a problem with MS, but I don't know enough about, because obviously I'm not a neurologist, so I don't know how it actually causes from different conditions like fibromyalgia to MS, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Hi, I'm just wondering, is there what the relationship is between dystonia and MS? I have both, and I'm just wondering. Yeah, I'm not, again, so I'm, I'm not too sure of the relationship between the different neurological conditions. Um, yeah, so I'm not a neurologist, so I can't comment, sorry. Hi, uh, I just have a question in the kind of a global sense mm -hmm. of MS in the world. Because you keep on uh, getting hearing things about vitamin D being a or being a factor in things, and when you look at the global where MS exists globally, it it would appear well at least anecdotally to me that uh, it has to be down to the the movement of people and and the northern races where they've gone. The Australia has no end of vitamin D, but it's got ton, tons of MS, mm -hmm. and same with New Zealand, Canada. All of these places, it's a very kind of. There seems to be a very clear correlation between the movements of the of the people who ended up in these places, yeah. where there is plenty of of sun and vitamin D. But again, that's where the genetics comes in. So these yes. people probably came from Ireland or wherever. So their genetic component is very strong. So it is all the interplay between the genetics and vitamin D. Like if you just don't take, if you don't have enough vitamin D on its own, but you don't have the genetic risks, that doesn't mean you're going to get MS. So it is. Some people, as I said, have a stronger genetic component and some people have a, a weaker one. So it is really an um, interplay between all of these and it depends kind of what happens in your lifestyle, lifetime, whether you could get it or not. So in those cases, it would be more genetic. And so the, are you kind of a globally, is there global research going on in that kind of uh, area in, in terms of this is Genomics Ireland? But yes. uh, do you have a kind of internationalization of, the, of this research because it's... Yes, yeah, so at the moment we're mainly focused on Ireland, but as I said, we're starting international collaborations and um, we are starting to work with people in Australia as well. Um, but for the type of study that we're doing to look at the genetic variants, a, a population like Ireland is the best to do it. And then once we kind of have discoveries, then it's best to go around the world to kind of compa compare. So. Really? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's quite common. It, it yeah. really is, yeah. And would it be, would it, um, should them people uh, go for this type of uh, investigation? Well, so if they don't have a diagnosis of a mess, they Oh, if they have a diagnosis of a MS, yes, certainly. Or without it. Oh, without it, um, no. But I would say that if you have a family who has it, you should do all of the, you know, make sure you take vitamin D supplements and do your exercise and everything that can, as much as possible, uh, prevent it. So 
Yes. Yeah. with MS, sorry, uh, family with MS or more people that maybe are just the one person that has MS in their family or in their... So the generally there would be a, some associate, like if you're... Genetic is what I'm trying to say. Yes, yeah, so obviously because it is a genetic disease, there, there will be some people who just are the only person in their family, but then in other cases there will be many. So it is, it depends on how much of the genetics you have and how, how strong your genetics links are. So how many of these different risk variants you have. Right. Yeah, but it can be it other, because it, it's a complex. So it's not just one or the other. There are, there are a mixture. Hi, can you just expand a little bit on what you mean by individualized treatment, please? Because um, I mean, you mentioned your collaboration with pharmaceutical companies, but pharmaceutical companies in general, they manufacture in bulk, they don't. Yes, so individual treat, individualized treatment. So for instance, we might find through our studies that we're looking at response to treatment. We might find that some people with a specific gene um, don't respond to a certain treatment. So we know then that that person shouldn't um, take that drug because they're not, going to, it's not, they're not going to respond to it. So where medicine is kind of should be going, I can't guarantee that it will here in Ireland right now, but where it will be going eventually, particularly like in things like cancer, you know, they test your, your genetics before they give you the drug because if you don't have that specific change, then the drug isn't going to work. So that could be expanded to different diseases like MS. So at the moment, for instance, I worked on melanoma. There is one uh, change in your DNA in a specific gene that causes that melanoma for maybe 70% of the people. So they test now, they test whether you have that gene or not, because otherwise, and they give you the treatment for that gene if, it, if that's the gene that caused it. But they don't give it to you if that's not the gene that caused it. So it could be the same in MS, but that's kind of where we're at the more start of the process, where you could then, you'd, you would test for that gene to see if you have it or not, and then give you the treatment if, it, if you do. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> before we find out the gene, the specific gene? Yeah, it is. Um, so, well, we're starting our analysis on uh, 1,000 people now. So we will be doing analysis. We're not going to wait until the study's over. So we will be doing analysis all the time. So we could find something very quickly, but I imagine because we do need larger numbers that it will be more, as you said, it, it is a longer term study. And I think, unfortunately, drug development is a longer process. So it's not like this is going to cure you tomorrow. So, but it is for more for the future. Yeah, yeah. So they have done similar studies, but I think for, for MS, this would be the largest of its scale. So they've done more studies where they look at the specific genes. So, um, or as I mentioned before, where they look, they target genes, you know, they um, sequence, but not fully sequence. So they just look at specific genes, but our theory is that there could be um, areas that they're missing because they haven't looked at the full sequence. Um, so of a scale, a, a study of this size, doing whole genome sequencing, as far as we're aware, it is the biggest, or, and you know, they might have done like 100 patients, but not anything like this. including other autoimmune conditions um, so other than MS? we have different studies. So each of the studies would be individual. So we have IBD at the moment and spondyloarthropathy is also an autoimmune condition, but we're not yes. looking at... Or uh, lupus. Um, lupus not yet, but um, I'd say in the future, yes. It's fairly common in, in, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. Your sample size is about 10% of the population of, Ireland, of Irish people who have multiple sclerosis, but if you're going to apply this to the world, is your sample size quite small to apply it to patients globally? Um, so, well, basically what we can find by looking at 10% of the population here is we can find the genetic determinants that are based here, and then you can test and make sure that that is applicable across the world then. So it's, as I said, it's, it's a very good population to study it initially, and then you always have to take your findings and make sure that it is relevant in other places too. If a person with MS has no family, does that break the link? Is it finished then? 
if they have no family. Well, they could have nieces and nephews, for instance. So if they have no family... Themse yeah, the person has no family with the MS. Um, well, like, as I said, like their nieces and nephews, for instance, could still have the same, would still be susceptible. So it's not necessarily... Obviously, it's broken down below because <laughs> there's, no, there's no one to get it. But like, if, yeah. yeah, their nieces and nephews, for instance, could. Okay. No, so they're not on it at the moment. So um, I'm not sure maybe your GP or else you can talk to your consultant and see if they would like to partake in the study or not. So we are talking with them, but um, we haven't started the study with them yet. So, yeah. Oh, God, you know, in, the te in the test, how uh, long did it take yeah, when it was going through the diagnostics? Like it was quite a few months, so we were very lucky that when we found it, it was just in time, basically. And um, so to do such analysis, it is very long, like as in more like a few months, not not years, but I think it was a few okay. months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have family, but I have nieces and oh sorry, I have nieces and nephews. Mm -hmm. So, but you also said earlier that you don't get your information back. On the on the slide, it said like if I go for the study, yeah. I don't get my information back. No, 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 you don't. So get how do I know if my nieces and nephews are? Well, you see, we don't give the information back because you're not necessarily. If you have MS, it doesn't mean that your uh, nieces and nephews are going to get MS. So you, because there's so many different risk genes, so there's like over, so far we know of 110, but there could be much more. So we can't um, tell whether a person is going to get uh, MS by looking at, we can't tell by looking at your genome whether your nieces and nephews are going to get MS or not. Okay, okay I think that's it. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks.